Thanks. All right. So um, we heard a lot of data today and a lot of information about the future of medicine, and which is essentially synonymous with the future of uh, healthy aging. Uh, and I want to sort of start by maybe for the audience to sort of um, get to know a little bit what you do here in Abu Dhabi and perhaps um, you can couch this a little bit in, in the context of what you might see as, as being a, a special in Abu Dhabi. I'll say this in the context both for, for a hospital that has already been a leading innovative center in the U.S. and also for a regulatory system that we saw yesterday a lot of evidence that this government is a very innovative government. And so that would be a, a really good place for people to get to know to get to know who you are. So shall we start with you? So thank you very much, uh, and uh, um, this is really quite a, a privilege to be here and to discuss uh, the, the future of medicine with uh, an illustrious audience. I mean, the, the speakers have been world class, and uh, we're really very grateful that they've managed to take time and and share their thoughts. Um, Abu Dhabi has uh, uh, gone through various reforms over the last. Uh, uh, few years, especially when it comes to healthcare. So the first wave of reform, major reform, happened in about 2007, when uh, the service provider uh, and the regulator were one entity, and they decided to split into an entity that's only a regulator, the health authority Abu Dhabi, um, which I represent today, and the service provider, which is called the uh, uh, Saha Company, Sharikat Saha in Arabic, um, and that. Uh, was the first of a, a number of uh, changes in 2007. So you had the split of the regulated service provider, you, have man you had mandatory health insurance for all uh, residents of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. You had the conversion of a public system that allowed uh, access of Emiratis uh, to the public sector uh, suddenly expanded to Emiratis through a, um, an insurance card going to the public sector and the private sector. Uh, you had a conversion of paper records into electronic records. And remember, in 2007, some clinics didn't even have an internet connection. Some clinics didn't even have computers. And yet, within one year, and it was stretched to a two-year period for, for those that struggled, 100% compliance to digitalization of uh, recording a visit, a clinic visit, of any patient entering any clinic or hospital. Uh, in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. So all of a sudden, this entity that uh, became known as the Health Authority Abu Dhabi had uh, massive data coming to it uh, for every diagnosis that was made, and the diagnoses were coded in, as ICD codes for every test that was done that was encoded as a CPT code for every drug that was prescribed. And for certain elements, we actually had results. So we, we started to, to collect results, things like HbA1c, uh, blood pressures, you know, we, we started to understand what, what was happening to, to patients. Um, this huge data is in the process of being analyzed and uh, it's, it's giving rise to uh, eventually what will become one of the most um, uh, populated registries for certain chronic disease. So I know we were talking about, you know, aging and so on, but, but actually chronic diseases is a, is a huge um, component of, uh, of of the burden of disease that we will inherit over the next uh, few generations. So, so the healthcare of Abu Dhabi is really changing. I, I, I would equate it to a child that went from crawling to sprinting <laughs> in, you know, very quickly. So over a decade, the changes that Abu Dhabi has gone through in healthcare would have taken other countries uh, many decades. Um, we're now in phase two of reform. Um, so uh, the, you know, the healthcare providers are, are you, you know, cooperating with some of the new changes that are coming out as well. So this is my perspective as, as a status quo, but I'm sure we've... Well, that's wonderful, and I think it plays very well to this context that Abu Dhabi and the UAE is a very innovative type of government. So, uh, yes, if we can hear about the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and how it's doing. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to be here. Uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi uh, here is uh, uh, really a part of the greater vision for, for Abu Dhabi and for healthcare reform in the Emirate and in the country and in a greater region. Uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi is one of the largest healthcare projects internationally, so worldwide. Uh, actually, for those of you who are just visiting uh, Abu Dhabi, our campus is about 15 minutes drive from here, a four million square foot facility 
uh, that uh, has opened its door to patients uh, not even two years ago. And it offers services in 55 uh, different specialties to, uh, uh, to patients here in Abu Dhabi, but also in a, in a greater region, as I mentioned. Probably the easiest way to summarize the uniqueness of Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi is that this is the first truly, uh, the first truly American hospital uh, that offers tertiary and quaternary, so high complexity care outside of the United States. So we have, came, we have come here to replicate the Cleveland Clinic model of care, which is a group practice model that is patient-centered and in a close collaboration with HUD uh, and our partners in Mubadala, we have uh, succeeded to, to open this hospital uh, in, in uh, as I mentioned, relatively recently. And although we're a very young institution, uh, we have grown very, very fast. Speaking about going from crawling to sprinting, I think <laughs> this, was, this was an appropriate description of our development. Uh, I've been living and working here in Abu Dhabi for the past six years. Our organization grew from 50 employees to over 4,000 employees from 72 different countries. And 80% um, of our physicians, so staff physicians, come from the United States. Uh, the remainder uh, are, of our colleagues come predominantly from the, from the Western Europe. A really exciting thing for us as an organization as we opened our doors and started providing uh, the services here was to see a phenomenal impact uh, that we have been able to create in a community for hundreds and now thousands and thousands of patients and patients and their families. This has been truly an inspirational journey. We have come here with several purposes as an organization. First is to elevate the level of care and offer a kind of a care that hasn't been offered historically here in the country to, uh, to our patients. Secondly, to do it in a such a way that it complements the existing offerings uh, uh, in a health, health healthcare market in Abu Dhabi. So we're not here to compete, but to complement in concordance with, uh, uh, with the strategy uh, for the healthcare development in Abu Dhabi. And lastly, to create a lasting impact. And this is really, really important in essentially to uh, create lasting impact through uh, opening uh, careers in healthcare to very many of young professionals here from the country uh, and a region in a hope that they're going to see healthcare as one of those kind of bright career choices uh, for, for the future. That's great. Thank you very much. I, I, you know, one of the things that, of course, uh, we discussed very briefly before, maybe you can tell us what you think is uh, special about comparing, if one can, you know, a, an established leading hospital center in Cleveland with one that is just starting in Abu Dhabi. What do you see as being the potential that something here will in fact totally lead the way you do things back in Cleveland yeah. as opposed to the other way around, which is obviously the beginning? Yeah, well, well thank you for asking this question. I think I'm very passionate about, about one fact, and that is that I, I firmly believe that the foundation to impact the health of people worldwide uh, one of the really, really important things that we have to, to tackle is uh, uh, a relative um, immobility and isolation of established healthcare organizations worldwide. If you think about uh, two aspects of every society that are really, really important for the success and the maturation of every society, and that is a healthcare and education, uh, you will quickly realize that a healthcare and uh, higher education is are typically- I'm glad you're mentioning education, of course. <laughs> exactly. Are, are typically the, the parts of our societal fabric that are most conservative. Most established healthcare organization, academic healthcare organization, of institutes of higher education have not been able to replicate itself outside of their own zip code, let alone international. And I think we here, and I, I believe I can speak for you as well, uh, are true beneficiaries of a vision for, for Abu Dhabi when the partnerships with an established healthcare organization such as New York University Abu Dhabi, Sorbonne, or Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi demonstrates that the creation of that excellence that most people perceive are strictly linked to a certain address is possible internationally. And I believe that these type of collaborations that we're speaking about right now are essential to implement all these beautiful ideas 
that all of you have mentioned right now. And in a, in a prior, in a prior, we have to create a vehicle for the work that Brad and his team are working on and uh, every speaker that is mentioned over here, we have to create a vehicle to bring those achievements closer to the people in need. But also we have to create a vehicle to expand our knowledge base and our research base so that we can have more people work on those ideas and that we ex expand the base in of, uh, of, of a talent that is going to bring this progress forward. And this is great because it's of course delivery, it's of course the context of what we talked about today is a lot more about preventative medicine and what we talked a lot about today, everyone I think agrees is going to impact much more our children than uh, in fact our generation. Uh, we hope that it impacts our generation but we certainly think it's gonna impact our children. So there's a real investment in this which is really the, the, the part that is also this, this regulatory component and innovation sometimes are seen in, in the US especially, and I know this, that the FDA you know, is, is both seen with incredibly reverence, but at the same time as a potential um, slower sort of than it should be um, type, of, type of regulatory uh, and, endeavor from some, some, uh, for some things to get to market quickly. My understanding is from the time that uh, there is a, a totally accepted, innovative type of medical treatment to the time that it goes through all the processes and also culturally gets used inside the hospital to treat patients, knowing that it works is an average of over 16 years, if I get that right. So from, from I think Abu Dhabi as being as innovative as, and as rapid, has it been able to see a way that it can in fact even be a better, certainly we've experienced it starting the cohort study here, that it's a very much more of a, a, a type of communication and connection that is very collaborative. So maybe you can speak about that in terms of the regulatory element. So, uh, I mean, Abu Dhabi is being very proactive in, uh, in trying to improve the quality of healthcare and uh, patient safety and, uh, and outcomes. So one of the elements that we're trying to do at the minute is uh, um, we've, we've started a, a JODA program where we collect metrics, fixed metrics from hospitals. We've started with hospitals because we deem them the highest risk. Um, there are uh, over 47 hospitals in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. We, we, we obtain from them quarterly reports on uh, objective metrics that are based on an international uh, uh, specification. Uh, these metrics are assessed uh, and, and we, we have a dashboard uh, that tells us who are the hospitals that are uh, doing really well in terms of patient safety, patient satisfaction, uh, outcomes, reduced infection rates, readmission rates, all of the you know, key, key metrics. Um, and we also see the ones that are doing uh, really not so well and in danger of harming a patient. So we use this information to, to immediately action, for instance, a, a snap inspection for a facility where we think error is about to happen before it happens. So this is being proactive in preventing uh, medical error and harm to patients. And we, we, you know, there's no better incentivization to a facility to improve if we are, we're about to publish this information. Mm. And, yes. uh, so there are, there are two, you know, Excellent. there are two incentivizers for, for healthcare providers uh, over and above patient safety and patient outcomes. I mean, that should be the core incentivization, but, you know, hard incentives, uh, reputational damage when you say you're going to publish data like this. So patients can read hospital ranks, you know, they choose where they want to go. And the other one is linking payment to it. And I know certain countries around the world have tried to link payment to quality. It doesn't always work. We will make it work. You know, I, I think when you have these two reinforcers to improvement of quality, one is reputation damage and another one is linking payment to it. You know, the, the ones that are harming patients will, will, will have to improve very quickly. And there's a whole remit of uh, disciplinary measures that one can do. So, so in terms of reform and in terms of uh, how the health authority is trying to adapt to new technologies, what's available. Um, I mean, if, if you look around the world, I mean, if, do you mind if, if I ask a question? How many, how many people do you think died from World War I in the last century, World War II? What sort of numbers are we talking about in millions? Um, about 17 million people died in World War I, and in World War II, between 60 to 80 million people, okay? Do you think that was the biggest killer of people in, in sort of as uh, non-preventable, uh, you know, sorry, as a, as a preventable cause of, cause of death? 
Um, if I told you that there was a, an influenza uh, pandemic in 1918 that killed 75 million people, uh, if I told you that HIV and AIDS were killing about over 30 million people in Africa, that, that figure continues. Uh, these are the big killers in, in, in our lifetime. And if we had to gauge what the legacy of the 20th century would be, I would say it's a much better understanding of infectious disease, um, much better understanding of how we can treat infectious disease and prevent it. And I would probably say, my own personal opinion, is that the 20th century will go down as the century uh, of vaccination. So the real breakthrough of the 20th century will be the discovery and implementation of vaccination throughout the world. When we come to the 21st century, we are now in a transition phase of going from, you know, our position today to the wonderful things we're seeing on the, on the screen and, and with the speakers earlier. We're going from a time where we're, we're now patching people's disease up. They, they have a heart attack, we sort of give them tablets. They have a stroke, we re give them rehabilitation. They develop diabetes, we give them all sorts of medications that may make them gain weight. And we're patching them up. So we're making people grow older, but uh, in pain and still with their disease, but they're just older. I think where we're heading, the next, uh, once we've gone through this transition phase and with the results of this amazing research that we've been hearing, is we're, we're heading towards living longer without disease. And that, I would say, is the holy grail. This is the utopian society that we're, we're heading towards a, a time where we can uh, live much longer. And I think the, the longevity, the, the age, uh, um, estimate of, of where we will be in the year 2030 is about 100, 101. We will all be, uh, you know, we'll all be aiming towards 100 in the year 2030, the generation that will, will live in, in, that, in that period. So, um, you know, we are now trying to cope with this interim period where we are succeeding in making people live longer. You know, the average age is now about 78 for women in this country, more or less what it is in the United States. So we're, we're, we're succeeding, but people are still in pain. They have their aches and pains. They need surgery. They have to go through terrible treatments like chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And soon our colleagues with gene therapy will make that a thing of the past. You know, regeneration medicine will make organ transplantation a thing of the past. Um, devices, bioengineering, and so on. Yeah, no, that's... So, so yeah. it's a special... It, just bear with us in this interim period. I think <laughs> our, our children will have a much better pain-free and disease-free life. Well, that's gr wonderful. I'll, I'll have one final question, and then I'll go to uh, the audience, so be prepared. Uh, which, what you just painted, there's so much to be said. Yesterday, among the many things that people really worried or focused on, wasn't said so explicitly, but essentially was about fake news, and so when you said vaccination era, you know, we do know that there is a sense still in some parts of the world where, where, where the sort of science is not winning out on, 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 on the culture, which is in, you know, incredible, but it's, I think, the major focus of the Gates Foundation at the moment. But in the next stage, it's about the wellness um, sort of quantification. It's the ability to, as you say, perhaps manage a disease-free life as long as possible which includes a lot of the innovations that we heard today. And so, you, you know, in a sense, this is a slightly different um, uh, sort of future. You build a hospital for the tertiary quaternary, and, and the future is in the more in the primary secondary. I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, I think uh, there is going to be, a, unfortunately, a very long, <laughs> sure. very long, very long uh, uh, transition, transition period. <laughs> So uh, I don't think that we've built but a hospital. But do you see any signs of the uh, primary, secondary? Hospital form. Yeah, there, yeah, I mean, obviously, we are putting much, much more effort onto, uh, onto prevention. And we're advocating it very, very strongly uh, for, for all of our patients. But the fact is, is that very many things that we spoke about today uh, do require a vehicle for delivery of those uh, uh, or those new therapies and this vehicle has to be an academic tertiary quaternary medical center where you have people uh, and processes and technology on board that will be able to implement uh, right. uh, those, those achievements uh, into clinical practice. So maybe we'll get a health nucleus around here. Yeah. Well, on, on, on that note, I want to thank you both for another wonderful time and please join me. Thank you, our speakers.